the spring garland and you've been sitting there patiently garland about uh, three months ago at the very beginning of the pandemic you put out a video that i happened to watch which said uh, that you can anticipate people breaking into food shops to feed themselves and that they weren't going to just sit around and take this and in fact a lot of the looting if you can call it that was of supermarkets at least in that first couple of nights in minneapolis so garland tell us what you're seeing right now and, and why you were right about that well, you know, what I saw at the beginning, and I wish I could say it was empirical data or, you know, some kind of a equation, but it was intuitive. I looked at the circumstance and I realized they're telling people, and I recall beforehand, 60% of Americans had less than $500 for an emergency. Within one week after the pandemic, after the lockdown, the uh, Congress came together to act on behalf of the richest people in the world and ensure that they, they weren't hurting, that they weren't required to have um, any savings whatsoever they were taking care of, the other American people got much of nothing. And I recognize the terms that I used. I said, people are out of work. Before you know it, at some point, they'll be out of work, out of food, and out of time. When I look at this, you know, you can certainly, as has been spoken here, I think that um, the George Floyd injustice was uh, a spark and that we had a tinderbox. The uh, dynamics were ready for this. So when I look at this crowd, of, you know, we hear a lot of discussion of race. I see a generation, uh, you know, a crowd, a generation. I see people say a large portion of them under 35, under 30, in their 20s. I see a generation who is furious. And when we look on the street, we see anger. And, and let's not forget, you know, I was a law enforcement officer for many years. I retired as a law enforcement. So I, I guess to some perspective, I can see things through the eyes of a law enforcement officer. I was a working class person. So I keep thinking to myself also, you know what? Somewhere off the coast of the Canary Islands, there's a 500 foot yacht and there's somebody watching working class police officers and you know, working poor people that at one time may have been working class, but now they're the poor and the working poor, beat the living daylights out of each other, tear up their own neighborhoods and wipe each other out. And what they figured out is this, their money is all in the stock market. The stock market isn't real. It's totally unrelated to the bricks and mortar stores. It's simply a shell game that they play. So all they had to do was ensure that the government put enough money into the stock market to ensure that their investment stayed the same. And it doesn't matter what happens on the ground. So they're sitting on their yachts. They're watching the people, uh, you know, the Americans beat themselves to death. And they're like, well, we haven't got our space station and our moon base quite ready yet for the next pandemic. So we can go there. But by the time they finish beating each other senseless, we should be able to make a move for a while and maybe watch this thing a little further. I'm being facetious in a way, but in a way, maybe not. So what I saw was, to me, a simple dynamic. One of, you know, I said things like this. People are not going to sit in the house and, and watch their children hungry. They're, they're, we see these long lines. So I think a lot of this is about desperation. And I also say this, this is the first wave. If I was right, I don't know if I was right. Maybe I was lucky. We won't call that good luck, bad luck, but maybe it was possible that it was a coincidence that I, that I, I predicted this and it happened. But if in fact I, I was anywhere near the truth, I would have to add this. The second wave has to be July and August because right now there's re, there are reopening going on. And people are thinking, OK, you know, I'm optimistic. They're reopening. I'll go back to that job I had as a, a bartender. If you're you know, if you're a millennial, as a waitress, as a the many things that they could do to make a dollar or some of them actually had jobs, you know, that gave them health care. That's the other thing. Forty two million people lost their jobs and their health care. They can't afford to get sick. They can't afford to get injured. But that being the case, there will be some expectation, A, that they'll come back to a job. B, that the job they come back to will be there and will allow them to make enough money to you know, feed their family, pay their bills, et cetera. Well, neither of those are, will be true for many, many of them. And then they will have some kind of an expectation that the government will step in and make them economically whole. That, Garland, Garland, let me yeah. interrupt you to ask you sure. about because you were a police officer. Yeah. Tell us something about the mentality of the cops and the behavior we've been seeing. To me, they know this is an anti-police a protest, at least it began that way. They take it personally, don't they? I mean, I have seen unbelievable, we've all seen these unbelievable scenes of pepper spraying and tear gassing people up against the wall and, and pushing people to the ground and all the other violence. What is the mentality of the average police officer right now in the middle of this? Does he see this as a personal attack on him and a chance for him to get back well, thing, you know, no, I, actually, I, I'd say something different, differently, and, and this is a sad state of affairs. 
And that is, it's not that these police officers are suddenly doing something different. To a lot of these police officers, this is routine. So a lot of all the police officers, if they come onto the scene, they arrest anyone they want to, they beat up anyone they want to. What we're seeing now is for poor people, for poor black people in a poor black community, this is a normal day of policing for them. Now we look at it and we see them push down, you know, a, a white millennial that's a small girl or someone who we're not accustomed to seeing get abused, or we see them grab a couple college students and drag them out of the car and we're outraged. But, you know, I've done a lot of work in Baltimore. I worked for the ACLU in both, I mean, specifically worked for the ACLU in Baltimore during the, the Department of Justice investigation. And what we found was what we see as outrageous was normal practice. I think Baltimore had arrested, when we checked one of our suits at the ACLU, they had upwards of 60,000 people that they would arrest. They would just say, shut up and do what I tell you or I'll arrest you. And if the person said anything, they bang them up with sticks for a, for a bit. They drag them in. The person hadn't committed any crime. They would hold them overnight and simply release them. But the person would get beaten and taken in that night. And oftentimes not arrested, they just get a beating. So just it's for talking back. Stuff, just for talking not back all that to abnormal them. for a lot of people. Garland, I just wanted to ask you very quickly about your post via social media. And it's also something that you've mentioned just now, but basically connecting the 42 million unemployed, thanks to COVID especially, and the tidal wave of evictions following that, and the billionaire corporate bailouts, plus this police violence, you know, resulting in this social unrest. Can you speak more about the connection between COVID-19 and the current wave of rebellions that we're seeing? And also, as you say, can you expand on the future that you see whether this is going to just intensify or do you think that it will in any way sort of die down as we go into the months well, ahead? A, a perfect example is Germany. In Germany, unemployment went from 5% to 6% because in Europe, the governments have made the people whom they locked down economically whole. And so they didn't create such an air of desperation. James Baldwin said the worst thing, and I'm paraphrasing, that a society can create is a person who has nothing to lose. And that's what we created. In fact, we created a generation of people who have nothing to lose. We had people who looked at their future and did not see a future. They had an expectation that they would live better than their parents, and they realized they had a house payment and no house. So they had no future. And then within eight weeks, they had no present. And at that point, we had an entire generation who has nothing to lose, and one need only watch one night of the protests, and you will recognize the age. There are some people of various ages, mm -hmm. but mostly this is a young generation who is furious. We see anger and fury. Um, as far as the future, in Los Angeles County alone, in this number, you know, I, I just feel like I've been, I keep reading it wrong. Over 350,000 evictions are predicted by the end of the summer in Los Angeles County alone. Over 50% of the people in the county lost their jobs during the pandemic. In America, 40% of the people who make $40,000 or less lost their jobs in March. In July, their money runs out, their unemployment runs out, and many people didn't get the 1200 or haven't gotten it yet, or because of the antiquated unemployment system uh, websites, haven't gotten it yet. The level of desperation is bad, but come July or August, when they expect they'll be able to go back to work and make a living and or the government will take action to ensure that they're not evicted, I predict a second wave. Now, there may be another spark, but it, but when you have this kind of hot tender, it doesn't take much of a spark. It won't take much. In fact, it could be something to do with another killing. It could be anything. But I predict when people are frightened and furious and they've already kind of learned, they've already kind of gotten an experience of going into the street, of releasing their anger. I suspect that July, August and going into the, the final uh, run up to the election that we're going to see a significant second wave of uh, social unrest. And, you know, I, like the other people here, it's not that I don't think that our government will or won't act in a manner that would address their issues. It's that I don't think the way that our government currently operates, that it that it's not what it produces.